our way. And, and uh, obviously, we have a lot on our, on our prayer list. We won't go through that deta- all those names this morning, so we'll do that during the worship time, the shepherd's prayer. So if you have a update or an additional re- prayer request, if you'll get with one of the, uh, one of the elders and so they can get that included at, uh, during the worship time. So glad you come our way today. Uh, excited to have this opportunity to begin our week together and study and uh, look forward to our time together today and, and worship to God. Let's all uh, bow together for prayer. Father, we're so grateful that you blessed us with the new week and this day as we come together, Father, to, to study your word and to worship you. Father, we're so grateful for this family we have here to be a part of your body. We're grateful, Father, for the care you have for each of us and, and for the, the care we have for one another. And Father, as we come together, we're always mindful of so many that can't be with us. We ask you to be with them and you know their needs as we'll lift those up to you uh, as you know them and, and again their needs as we uh, present them to the entire family later today. We're always mindful of them. Father, we're thankful for all of our teachers this morning. We pray you be with them uh, as they teach our children. Father, thank you for their dedication and their time that they are given to such an important work. We pray you be with our children, Father, that you that you help them as they strive to grow in this uh, society that we live in today. We pray, Father, that we will help have your word to be ingrained in their lives, Father, that they can live faithful lives to you and, and enjoy the hope and the, and the honor and the direction that you give us for our lives, Father. Uh, Father, again, we just thank you for this day. We pray that all we do lifts you up, that we give you glory. And Father, we're just so grateful for your son and his sacrifice that makes all this uh, possible for us and the hope that we have through, through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, we, uh, again, we're starting each uh, back on our Acts class this morning. I appreciate uh, the fill-ins last week while I was out of town. So Dr. Manor has a great clip this morning that will help us in our uh, continued study in, in uh, the second chapter of Acts. And, when, and we're going to go ahead and, and start that video. Go ahead, Ryan, and start the video if you would. <clears throat> when we think in terms of essentially any group, there's something that brings them together, something that unifies their thinking, their allegiance, their loyalties. Uh, This has always been the case. And when a a group begins to adopt different kind of philosophies and ideas, that's when the group begins to fragment and break apart. Well, God has always had issues that he wants the people who follow him to adhere to. And when we think in terms of the Old Testament background, there are three major feasts. Of course, the, the Torah and the scriptures of the Old Testament were sort of the the document that tied them together, but there were three feasts that the children of Israel were to celebrate in which they were all to come together to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem in these early passages is not identified as the location where this is going to take place, but it's referred to as the place that the Lord will choose. And we later find out that this is going to be Jerusalem. And those three feasts are the Passover, Uh, This is the term takes place uh, about 50 days after the Passover. And this is also known as the Feast of the Harvest, the Day of the First Fruits. And in the New Testament, it's known as Pentecost. And the word Pentecost basically refers to the idea of 50 because the prescription is that apparently with the Sabbath after the Passover, they count seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, and then the day after that seventh Sabbath is the Pentecost. So it's always going to be on the first day of the week. The third feast that the Old Testament talks about is the Feast of Booths. Uh, These are temporary structures that the people would build. Traditionally, it was referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, but because of some confusion with the tabernacle structure itself, a better phrase is the Feast of Booths. All of these require the children of Israel to come together. But the problem that exists is that uh, the time involved in order to make the trip. As long as Israel was in a tight geographic area, this was not as much of a problem. The distance uh, that 
the average maximum sustained travel that an individual can do usually is about 20 miles a day. So that's sort of a rule of thumb. Most travel is not that quick in the ancient world. But from Nazareth to Jerusalem, and I use this as the example because when Jesus' parents take him to Jerusalem for uh, when he's age 12, the distance as a crow flies is about 64 miles. However, in the first century world, most of the Jews in the northern part of Israel did not travel straight through, certainly in a straight line because geography typically doesn't allow that. But they would typically, in order to avoid Samaria, they would make the trip around Samaria, crossing over the Jordan River into the eastern part of the Jordan Valley, and then back across at approximately Jericho and make their way to Jerusalem. And the distance involved here is about 100 miles or so. So the trip one way would be five plus days. Now, there's a lot that can happen in basically a 10 day plus being gone from home. But God has given his promise in the book of Exodus that if they were faithful to him, that their land would be protected when they would be away to visit and to celebrate on these pilgrimages. So they didn't have to worry about enemy attacks if they were, as a nation, being faithful to the Lord. But eventually there's going to be the exiles, the diaspora. The word diaspora simply means dispersion. It's the scattering of the people. And the scattering of the people occurs because of Israel's refusal to follow the will of God. So you have two major exiles that take place. One is with the Assyrians in 721 BC, and the second is with the Babylonians, which goes in several stages. And the people of God, the Jews, are scattered in all kinds of different directions. Now, this is going to create a bit of a logistical problem. If they're going to celebrate uh, the three feasts, then there's a lot of travel involved here. And if we think in terms of the distance, for instance, uh, that is implied, the book of Acts describes on the day of Pentecost, these people coming together, they hear the apostles speaking in their own languages, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Serena and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now, if you listen to the geography here, here's a map that shows where each of these locations is situated in the ancient world. And this is significantly removed from the area of Jerusalem. As a crow flies, the distance from Rome to Jerusalem is about 1,430 miles. That would calculate on a 20 mile a day trip, 72 days. Well, if you make the trip from Rome to go to Jerusalem for Passover, and you're there to fulfill that feast, you don't have enough time to go back home and then back up Pentecost. So apparently, a lot of these people from distant lands would come for Passover, perhaps, and then they would stay the duration for the 50 days until Pentecost arrives. And this is going to set the stage for some of the issues that begin to unfold later in the book of Acts, because the geography becomes a critical part. Now, Josephus, an ancient uh, historian that we often rely upon, and he, he sometimes has a tendency to exaggerate some of the data, but he describes the population of Jerusalem during the Passover at the beginning of the Roman War, which took place roughly 67 to 70 AD. And he indicates that the average number of people eating a sacrificed lamb was 10 or so, sometimes up to as many as 20 people who would sacrifice. But he calculates and reports that 255,600 lambs were killed on the occasion of that Passover. And that would calculate to about 2,700,000 people squashed into the city of Jerusalem for this special feast. And that's the kind of setting, not necessarily that many, but that's the kind of setting that would be there gathered from all of those different countries who some of them would be hearing the apostles speaking and be intrigued by what is the significance of this message. Great background information there. And it's really going to come into play with what we're going to see here in chapter 2 
And uh, again, I can't uh, uh, explain how valuable uh, Dr. Manner's insight is to really help and give us the setting of what we're looking at. It makes this, this book come alive to us. So we kind of understand now why all these people are, have come together, and we're going we're gonna to look at that some. This, uh, this por- the chapter two of Acts is, has been called many things. Uh, it's it's uh, one of the most central sections of the whole New Testament. And even uh, Dr. J.D. Bells, who was a professor at Harding right, right before I got there, and he's written numerous books, and he's one of those guys that, that you had to read his book, and you read again going, now what did he say? I mean, he was just a deep thinker. He wrote an entire book on this chapter called The Hub of the Bible. Uh, because there's so much in this chapter. Uh, So we're not going to spend that kind of time on it, but once you understand how important this is, we're going to really dig into some things. We're going to take us a couple of weeks to get through it. We're going to deal with Peter's speech, which we won't get to that today. Next week, we're going to look at the first gospel sermon and the power and the message that's in that. Uh, which are really a, a powerful thing for us to look at. So uh, just to give you ideas about just how important this study is uh, and how important chapter 2 of Acts is for us, it's the very beginnings that cause us to be here today. This is the very beginnings, the very beginnings of the New Testament church. And so here's the things that happened on the Pentecost. Again, the church was established that you and I are a part of you know, 2,000, over 2,000 years later, this is the beginnings. This is our heritage. This is what we're going to look at was prophesied about. And that's why this is such an important part, uh, important teaching, because all the prophecies, and we'll look at some of those, and Greg even mentioned a couple weeks ago, these prophecies are being fulfilled. Here's the day. Here's the day that all these prophets had looked towards, and they hadn't lived to see the day. And now that day has come. So this is, uh, this is what we're going to be looking at. The gospel is preached in its fullness for the first time, and that's what I mentioned about uh, Peter's sermon, which, again, we won't get to today. But it's the first time the gospel, Jesus has died and been resurrection, resurrected. That's the message of the gospel, and it's the first time that that message is going to be preached. And then uh, the third idea, there's a new class of humanity that came into existence. Uh, this is the this is the wording that the, the truth for today uses. What class of humanity would that be? I heard somebody say something. Christians, Christians. This is where it all starts. Followers of Christ, and we see later in Acts where the term is actually going to be coined. Acts eleven twenty six. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. But this is where that all began. So we think about the prophecy. This was all to take place in Jerusalem. It's where we looked at the end of Luke uh, when he told his disciples to go into Jerusalem and wait for power on high. This is what was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 2, verses 2 to 3. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established at the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go into the mountains to the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths, for the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, Part of that that prophecy, the word's going to go forth from Jerusalem. That's where it was to start from. And so we're, we're going to see that start. And some of the same terminology Isaiah uses that Luke records in Luke 24, all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And Isaiah refers to all the nations. And the house of the Lord, keep that idea, the house of the Lord. We're going to come back to that. That's going to, that's going to play a role in something we're going to look at here uh, in a few minutes uh, from that beginning. Um, so very important. Uh, just kind of hit on a couple other prophecies uh, to, to again just just to reiterate the importance of this great great event we're going to study about Daniel two forty four Daniel prophesies about this day when he writes in the days of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed that kingdom will not be left for another people it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will itself endure forever. 
God's kingdom will endure forever. And he's referring to, he's prophesying about God's kingdom on earth. The church is going to be established. Daniel has described in his, his uh, the visions that have been seen by the king. He ex- describes the different kingdoms. And this kingdom he's thinking of, talking about is the iron kingdom, which represents Rome. So it's in the days of Rome that Daniel's revealing that a kingdom will be established that will last forever. And so we're seeing this happen in Jerusalem as prophesied in the days of the kingdom of Rome. And so we're seeing all that uh, come, to, come to play here. Uh, other, any thoughts or comments on that? So <clears throat> another passage to look at. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, 17 through 19 after he had blessed Simon's uh, uh, <clears throat> confession of who Jesus was. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. We've talked about this passage in the past, and all I want to show in this passage is the interchangeable nature of the kingdom and the church. In this passage, uh, I will build my church and you'll have the keys to the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom are going to be displayed by Peter How, Chapter 2 of Acts. He's going to open the kingdom. He's got the keys. He's going to open the kingdom of heaven. So he interchanges church to the kingdom. Church is the kingdom. Church is the kingdom. The church is God's kingdom on earth. And so we see that uh, we see that prophesied, and and we see how important this chapter is, because that's where all this is finally coming together. This is finally happening. It's finally being fulfilled, and a powerful a powerful thing that's that's going to happen. Literally a powerful thing, because power from on high is going to fall on the apostles, and we're going to talk about the importance of that and what that was, what that appeared to look like. Literally, power, a powerful day, a powerful day. Something that's never been seen before and never will be seen again. Uh, that's the kind of day this is. I'm setting the stage, as Dr. Manor described. And all these people have come there because here we see, very first verse of chapter 1, or first verse of chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Anything from what Dr. Manor said about Pentecost that struck you, that uh, kind of pricked your attention a little bit, maybe something you hadn't heard or thought of before. The travel time. A three or four night of time to go from one place to the other. The travel time, yeah. We're, we'll, we'll see in verse 15 the list where all they come from. And, they, and as he used in his slide, coming from Rome, I mean, yeah, a lot of travel time, huh? A lot of travel time. Oh, you're over there. You're usually over there. <laughs> hey, uh, I like how you use the math to show how many people would eat uh, a lamb. You know, yeah. And you use that to how many people would be there. So he, they really did kickstart the whole church deal because two, did he say two million people? He said two million, and that's some numbers I used from Josephus, which he mentioned Josephus can stretch things a little bit, but still, it's a lot of people. So a lot of people saw it, and a lot of people heard about it that didn't see it. Perfect time for this to happen where it does. In, in previous video from Dr. Manor, we've talked about the, the cross-section of people that come across Jerusalem and, and God's wisdom and why that would happen here, didn't we? So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point, Mike. appreciate you raising that point. But, yeah, some really interesting stuff, the dynamics of, of all the people that are going to be there. Now, you can read a lot of other commentary. You're going to see a lot of other numbers that may be a lot less than what he speculated. Josephus uses a big number and others speculate different numbers, but there's a crowd of people there. And uh, yes, ma'am, Nancy. I really like the fact that how they relied on the Lord and this assurance of their property. If they, were, if they were devoted to God and left their property and they were at a time to where, you know, it was, it was hostile times that somebody might come in and take it while they were gone, God said, that won't happen if you're obeying me. Isn't that interesting? He promised them that. And so they could take those long journeys. They could be gone a long time from home, knowing they were doing God's will, being devout. We're going to look at devout devout men that's mentioned. These were people that were serious about their religion to make that trip. 
and they knew God would protect their land. Great point. And we'll come to that idea of devout. These were devout. You, you don't travel that long, Mike, do you, if you're not pretty serious? And devout. Yeah, long time and to, to get there. So the importance of that. And uh, uh, the other thing is, the idea is, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me go ahead and show you. We already know the answers to these questions. Uh, hey, Ryan, can you forward it for me? I'm stuck. Uh, the three major feasts, you remember the three major feasts were uh, Passover, Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. Yeah. And just from a time of year, oh, Ryan's not back there. He left me. Yeah, Greg, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, if you can forward that. Um, it's just stuck. Passover came around the middle of April. Some of this time of year, Easter, we understand the time of year of Easter is Passover. We know what time of year that was. That's history. We know that for a fact. The day of Pentecost is around June, 50 days after Easter or Passover. And the Feast of Tabernacles was in the fall, around October or so. So this was a good time of travel. It said some would make sure they stayed for Pentecost. The weather would be better. But that's the idea, too. They traveled that far. Uh, thank you. They traveled that far that they would stay. You don't have time. His point was, Dr. Manner's point, you don't have time to leave and come back, do you, in 50 days? And here's how we know. Here's another significance. We have people that want to argue about the first day of the week. There's so many things that happen on the first day of the week. We know Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. We know that Pentecost, when the church started, was the first day of the week. Pentecost was always... The first day of the week, the old law. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Seven Sabbath is 49 days. 50 days is the next day. Sabbath is Saturday. First day of the week is the next day. It was always the first day of the week. The first day of the week is significant. That's why we're gathered today. That's why we're worshiping today on the first day of the week. It's the day our Lord rose. It's the day the church was established. That's the day that we come together to remember that around the table. Uh, very significant day. So that's another important uh, part of this. We know it means 50. Talk about travel. I've read some stuff uh, that uh, goes along with Dr. Dale Manor. Some teachers decree that if a Jewish man lived within 90 days traveling distance, he was expected to come to the feast. So if they lived in, in this dysphoria that the scattering, if you live 90 days, this is what their, their rabbis decreed, is a decree. If you live within 90 days of Jerusalem, you're pretty much required, Jewish male, to return for those three feasts. So that puts another, if you're devout, you're going to have to be pretty devout. But that's why you would listen to your rabbi teachers, because they would, yes, sir. Yeah. To do that miles, three times a year. Exactly. Yeah, we talked about that, and he brings that out, the Samaritans, that you actually walk around a country that you hate them so much that you're willing to add days to your travel, huh, Mike? Probably, yeah, at least. You saw how much distance there was to circle around that. And 20, you know, average travel time was about 20 miles a day. So, yeah, it was a lot of days just because of your hatred for a people. You don't want to put your foot on their soil. And uh, I'm sorry? You just move. <laughs> move closer. Move to Jerusalem. Yeah. But there was a lot of reasons why they were scattered. So, any other thoughts or comments before we get into the rest of the text? we we'll to look at the power from on high. Uh, so here's what happens. They're gathered together on Pentecost in verses 2 through 4. Here's, here's what happens. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Okay, here's the promise that we've talked about. And John talked about it. John the baptizer talked about it in Matthew 3.11. 
when he's referring to Jesus and John the baptizer says there, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this, this, this fire, we're going to talk about this fire distributing itself in tongues. It's not probably not the fire that he's talking about in Matthew 3. That fire was for those, the everlasting fire of punishment that's considered there, not considered this, this, uh, this point here. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see that, how it's outpoured here, uh, as Jesus had promised. Uh, also, <clears throat> let's think about who, who Jesus is talking to. In John 1, John 1, uh, Acts 1, and you look at the first eight ch- verses of that, when Jesus has given them this promise, Jesus is quoting back to Matthew 3.11. Jesus says this in Acts 1.5, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 2 of chapter 1, who, He's talking to the apostles. He's talking to the apostles there. And He goes on in verse 8 in that context, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Look at this aspect of it that the apostles are the ones who receive this power from on high. We're going to talk, break that down again. They're the ones next here. But one thing that's back up, fill the house. Now, we've talked about this upper room. Dr. Manor talked about the upper room last week. We know that when they were in the upper room, the house of God and Isaiah's prophecy, and even uh, it was Solomon who built the house for him, Stephen says. In Luke 24, 52, the, what the apostles have been doing waiting for this power on high. They were worshiping Him, returned to Jerusalem, great joy in God. That gives rise to the room of a house, temple. The, the, the court of the Gentiles was a big porch areas around the temple, which had about 25 to 30. And that's where they would study. Jesus had studied there and taught there. This happens in the temple. This unfold this more. We're going to see how the crowds really are able to be a part of and see a part of what's going on because it appears to be God's house uh, where, they are, where, where they are at this time when this happens. Any, any thoughts or comments on that? I think that's really an important thing for us to note when we look in the context here. Uh, they're not in the upper, upper room of the house where they'd stayed. They're, they're in the temple. So a ph- phenomenon was seen. Uh, Acts 2, the, the third verse, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Now, there appeared to them tongues as a fire. There's no real fire. It appears, there appears to be this one flame that, that pain in, it had the appearance of maybe a, a tongue shape or something, but it disperses itself over each of the apostles. So that's the, that's the image we, we see here. And no doubt, with the rushing of the mighty wind, and then we see this, it's going to draw some attention. It's not a stormy day. There's no effects of a storm. You just hear this noise of a huge, mighty wind, like a hurricane with no effect. A powerful, a powerful scene. No, I don't do a good job trying to, it's hard to try to help us visualize this, but. Yeah, Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris, exactly. It's a great point. Great point, Chris. Thanks for helping me out there. Yeah, the bur- bush burn, bush burn, and not consume with fire. Well, that's something God can do that we can't comprehend, can we? We just can't comprehend that. That's God's power. That's even why we see how this is such a powerful thing. How can this look like flame and it's not fire? It's God's power. How He displayed His power uh, at this time. Other thoughts or, or comments of who spoke in the world today? And we'll talk about that more in the book of Acts uh, is how that works. But who spoke in tongues? We study Scripture. Scripture tells us. We look at the context. I've talked to you about, we've shared together the context. The context power from on high at this time, the, the fiery tongues. Uh, that, that Instructions from Jesus in verses 1. They're the ones, okay? Then look at the end of chapter 1 uh, uh, to replace Judas. Yeah. So at the end of chapter 1, verse 26, the apostles are the ones who's, who are getting chapter divisions. Apostles who are trying to choose who God wanted to replace Judas. So the context itself tells us that they 
that goes back and represents the day, day of the previous verse are the apostles. That's who's together. That's who this is happening to uh, in that in context. The amazement of the multitude directed toward the apostles because what did they say about They're Galileans. They're Galileans. Greg? Exactly. I mean, that was the whole point behind it. It's not for you to say that I can speak in tongues and not understand what you're saying. You're not speaking in tongues. You're just babbling. Because they understood Peter and Paul and all them that were speaking in tongues. They absolutely understood everything they were saying in a different language. Yeah, and you've hit the nail on the head. These were languages. It's not gibberish. It's not unknown utterances. These were known languages. They were unknown to the apostles because they were unlearned and ignorant men they're going to refer to. How do they know these languages? They're unlearned and ignorant men from Galilee. The dean, I'm sorry. Most modern translations, they don't use the word tongue. They, they say other languages. In fact, the NIV footnote says other languages. So they, they changed it. The, some religions or some they they used the King James because they used they added the word unknown, unknown. and that's the reason they changed it to King yeah. James and that's an added word that's not in the original. I appreciate you bringing that up because that's what's happened. Some other translations put had unknown in there, like Dean's talked about, and it means just unknown to the apostles. It wasn't a, a gibberish; they were known languages. The text is going to prove that. We're going to look at that. The text proves it. This is the one place in Scripture that tongues are defined. We read about other tongues, other places. This is the place where it's defined because this is where it begins. And Scripture is going to define for us what tongues are. Uh, John? The way I've always read that, was, I thought there were more than 12 different nationalities there. They were all Jewish. But that the people heard in their <coughs> language, not that each, they spoke all of them. Yeah, they spoke their languages. We're going we're gonna to talk about that some more. They actually spoke their languages. They heard it in their languages. We're going to talk about this because these, these people are bilingual people. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. So, uh, uh, well, not only were they speaking in the language, but they understood everything they were saying. Yeah. They understood. We're going to look at that. So, yeah, that's, uh, we'll look at the passage that talks about that. So the purpose is, let's talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Inspiration, obviously, revelation. We told that Jesus told them the Comforter would bring to their remembrance all things that I've said to you. He told them they would be given what to say, what to speak. So part of, that's part of it. Identification to confirm the message that they're going, they're going to go out and teach, and the impartation. Part of what we're going to study in this in in Acts is how the apostles could pass on these gifts and pass on these gifts, and it was from the apostles that this is passed on. Uh, so we're gonna we'll talk about that, but that's some of the purposes of what happened then. And it, it uh, that uh, they imparted the gifts on to the first century Christians with miraculous gifts to stabilize the infant church, which didn't have the written New Testament. So that was a purpose for that, which we'll talk about more. So let's look now. We're talking about you wrote, wrote some uh, made some good discussions. So let's look at the reaction of the crowd, which is going to tell us exactly what Greg's talking about, what John's talking about. Here they go. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, this idea of living in Jerusalem, it doesn't mean that all these people were just residents of Jerusalem. When they came to Jerusalem, they were staying in Jerusalem, is the idea that the context means. All these people would come in from the feast. They were staying in Jerusalem. Okay, This crowd that Dr. Manor talked about. So they were considered to be staying in Jerusalem, not that they had a long-time residence, not their permanent home, but all these people were staying there. And the devout men from every nation under heaven, 
uh, is my convention. You know, they had to be devout to make this journey and dedicate themselves to being there. So it says, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, as you can imagine, and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. John, they were speaking. They weren't just hearing it in their, these apostles were speaking it in their languages. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Their aspect there is, how can this be? They're just Galileans. Uh, we'll see later on, they're referred to as unlearned and ignorant men. How can they be able to speak in these languages? And now, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Okay, now these people in that time were bilingual. They either spoke Aramaic or Greek. They also spoke the language of their home where they came from. Many dialects and many languages as we're going to, be, as we're going to see where they all came from. So Peter in his sermon is going to speak, we'll talk about his Aramaic or Greek that he's going to preach in. But in this instance, they also, they knew Aramaic or Greek, but they're hearing the language in their language of their home country. And they're going, that's why they say that. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? Our original language. They're communicating with their original language. Back to your point, Greg, they understood what they were saying, didn't they? It was language. It wasn't gibberish. It wasn't something they couldn't comprehend. It wasn't some ecstatic utterance, I think they call it, some God language that they were given the ability to understand. No, it's language. It's language. Uh, it was, it's known languages of their time that they needed. So what we're talking about, probably where this occurred, here's a diagram of the temple in that day. And you can see on the right side and the left-hand side, this court of Gentiles, this big open area. And you see on the edges, this colonnades, those are little apartments that are around the edges. And so there's a lot of open area for a crowd to gather. There's a lot of open area where crowds would be there all the time, especially during, during a feast time. It said that the outermost court contained about 35 acres, 35 acres around the temple uh, itself. So there's a lot of a lot of space for crowds to gather. So we can imagine this crowd that's gathered in this space as they hear hear them speaking in their own languages. And then verses nine through thirteen, uh, as we're told, who all's gathered there: Parthians, Medes. Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. So we see this reaction as uh, even Dr. Manor had talked about all these countries that were represented there, had come together uh, and were part of the, the feast for Pentecost. And they're all hearing this language and uh, hearing, this, uh, uh, hearing the apostles speak in their own languages. Fifteen regions and nations are, are listed here, uh, really all over the world uh, from that time that have come to, uh, come to Jerusalem for that time. And even proselytes, those who were converted to Judaism, uh, who were Gentiles, that's what proselyte is, a Gentile who is converted to Judaism. Even those had come who were participating in the feast because now they've converted, converted to Judaism. And there were some, some who have done that. So it even refers to those who have come. Uh, and you, you kind of, we sense their words of amazement, uh, meant to show other, the terms that are used in these few verses is bewildered, amazed, and astonished. Bewildered, amazed, and astonished. What does that characterize for you, their reaction? If we can't think of a different word than those, they were surprised, I guess, but it, it was incredible, wasn't it? It's incredible what, what they're seeing and what's occurring, and they're, they're, question, they're trying to figure out what is going on. And what do they say? What does this mean? What does this mean? Now think of this. They're in the temple. 
and they see this going on, what's this is this has got to mean something. And shock, yeah. And shocked that these Galileans, you know, they continue to mention that. These are Galileans. And we talked about them as we studied through the life of Christ. You know, the difference in Galileans were not highly respected, and Jesus had brought them in as his disciples and his apostles, even. The only one that wasn't a Galilean was who? Judas. Judas was the only one of the 12 apostles who wasn't a Galilean. He was from Judea. Now, Judas has been replaced with Matthias, and every indication is Matthias is a Galilean, and the reference is given that they're all Galileans. So we see that, that purpose, that reason there. So what does this mean? And of course, you always have uh, skeptics, and they're, well, they're full of sweet wine. So what does this mean? So in chapter 2, Peter's going to tell them what this means. So they're setting the stage because it says, did you catch what it says they're telling them? What does it say that the tongues, what they're saying when they're speaking the tongues? In verse 11, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of what? The mighty deeds of God. So they're preparing this people. So no doubt they're probably telling them about God, what God has done for His people through history. They've been inspired by the Spirit here. They're speaking in these tongues. They're telling them about the mighty deeds of God. They're getting them ready for what Peter's going to say. They're preparing him for Peter's sermon. Yes, ma'am. It's a great point. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, she mentioned maybe it's a lot like, lot like the speech that Stephen gives because we have it recorded in Scripture because he talked about the mighty deeds that God did. It was important to lay that out for him, wasn't it, for the people? Very good point, Karen. Appreciate that. Very likely uh, a lot of that, what's going on here. Mike? Do you think that maybe some of the ones that were mocking were Jewish leaders? Very, yeah, that's very, that's, it could be very likely, huh? We, yeah. They do something like that. I wouldn't be mocking. We'll talk about that a little more in Peter's speech because Peter's going to address it. Peter will address it more in his sermon. And so, but yeah, no doubt there's probably some leaders in this group. They're going to be mocking about it. But, uh, and you always have skeptics for anything, don't you? So, We'll talk about that more in the next section. In the, so they're, they're laying this out, ready for Peter uh, to, to preach that first gospel sermon and a powerful message that he's going to convey uh, to the people. Other, uh, about out of time, any other final thoughts or, or comments? Randy, so the speech yeah, Greg. In, in these other times, it wasn't because they couldn't understand one another. This was strictly a display of power and to establish authority for Peter and these men, as they carry out this message, it wasn't necessary. It was just simply to a miraculous sign. Great point, because like I mentioned, they're bilingual. They could speak Aramaic or Greek, but they're hearing this in their original. It's the power that this is my original language that that they're speaking. So it's the power of God, and they knew there was something because of the Galileans being able to speak that. So yeah, great point, Greg. I appreciate that, Bill. Do what? It's also what Paul talks about in the Corinthians, where he's talking about, you know, when I speak, it'll be like banging symbols or anything. It's step, being a step of the Spirit. Yeah. Everything coming together in God's plan. Good point. And being fulfilled. Bill? Uh, in 1944, they have a fellow named Zion come by and converted two people here in North Carolina. They think that the church is going to go. In 1945, it was established. That's where it all began. It all began. Yeah. And I, I it's because of that that we're here, even though this right. body established in 1945, we're all a part of that beginning. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the church grew. There's a time when the church grew, wasn't it, Bill? Great point. 
Yeah, over the years, the influence this church has had. I appreciate that, Bill. And that's what we're to be about, aren't we? That's God's people. And we're going to see the power the church had in the beginning influencing the entire world. So appreciate that, Bill. Appreciate your comments this morning. Uh, read the read Peter's sermon for next week. Our pages in the Truth for Today is pages 61 through 6, 79. 61 through 79 if you're following along there. But hopefully this sets the stage for this first gospel sermon, and we'll deal with uh, some of these other issues uh, as we move forward in that. So again, thanks for your good comments this morning.